Take your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 3, please. Genesis chapter number 3. <clears throat> Give you a little personal illustration of lessons, you know, lessons from time to time that we learn. I was reminded again this morning. Can y'all pull me down just a little bit? I feel just a touch loud. Thank you. Uh, I was reminded again this morning of the importance of every member in the body of Christ. <clears throat> Some lessons are harder and more painful to learn than others, uh, but I was reminded very, very dramatically this morning. Uh, my wife has some little three-pound dumbbells. She's, she also has a 280-pound dumbbell, but that's uh, another story for another time. Uh, but she's got these little three-pound dumbbells. From time to time, the kids get them out and play with them, and then they have the habit of just coming in and throwing them up on the shelf in the closet and apparently one of them had landed on my tie. You know, I've got a tie rack there. And this morning uh, when I grabbed my tie, it pulled one of those dumbbells off. And it dropped about four feet and landed on my bare big toe. And uh, needless to say, uh, the immediate was response was not spiritual. Um, it took me a little while to get the spiritual content out of it. And I hope you don't, you know, fault me too bad. It wasn't carnal necessarily. It just wasn't spiritual. And uh, so I, I spoke in tongues for a moment because it was, there were no audible words that came out. I mean, it really kind of was just kind of mumbo jumbo. And, uh, but apparently uh, it was interpreted pretty well because Mandy knew immediately something bad had happened. And uh, so anyway, um, you say, well, preacher, I just feel like I am just a big toe in the body of Christ. Well, I want you to know you carry a great deal of importance. Yes. Amen. I mean, you're used for balancing things out like you wouldn't believe. And uh, if you're not right, you cause a lot of pain to the rest of the body. So stay right. Amen. All right. Well, there's the spiritual lesson out of my uh, personal life. Let's go to Genesis chapter number three. And we might as well laugh about it because... Uh, the way I feel right now, it's laugh or cry, so we'll just laugh. Verse number one, as we stand together, Genesis chapter number three, I'm going to go back, try to finish the message I started last Sunday morning, and uh, I want to try to get to this last point, and uh, we'll, we'll go through it and do a little bit of recap just to bring us back up to this. I'll try not to spend too much time there. The Bible said in verse number one, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. The eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? He said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? The man said, The woman whom thou gavest to, me with, or gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Heavenly Father, I come to you today. I thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for what you've done around here today. Lord, I thank you again for the sweet presence of God. And I pray now you'd bless the reading of your word. Lord, bless the preaching time. I stand in great need of you now. I pray that you would order my lips to speak every word they ought to speak and none they shouldn't. I pray you'd use me as a vessel, a mouthpiece to preach the word of God. Help our hearts, I pray. Let us see and long for the presence of God in our lives. We'll bless you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. You can be seated. 
uh, Brother Jeremy testified this morning, and I thought, uh, well, brother, why don't you just come up and get my notes and finish it off? He danced all around what I was going to preach, and, uh, and, and that's fine. God had ordered it, and I thank the Lord for it. And uh, I'll elaborate a little bit on where he took us this morning because of, of the dealing in my heart. And last Sunday morning, I started a message and took her text out of verse number 11 where God said to Adam, Who told thee that thou wast naked? And I began preaching a message on who told you that. And that is exactly what we have before us. Adam here has hid from God. And uh, as God inquires about where Adam is and why Adam is not there to commune with the Lord, he said, where art thou? And Adam said, we hid ourselves because we were naked. And uh, God looked at Adam and he said, who told you that? And I find there's a lot of things today that are going on in Christianity that I would love to have the opportunity just to sit down and ask some people, who told you that? Who told you that you could go down that road and it turn out okay? Who told you that you could leave the principles of the Bible and everything be all right? Who told you that you could take worship down another road and it not affect the church? Who told you that you could change certain standards and it not affect your family? Who told you that you could sacrifice some areas of your life and everything continue on just like it had been before? I would love to sit down and simply ask them, who told you that? Because I have a sneaking suspicion it would be the same one that had been talking with Eve and Adam in the garden. I would love that opportunity. We have had folks that have left the church. I would love to have had the opportunity to sit down and ask them who told them the things that they were that they had running in their mind. I would love to have the opportunity to say we've had people come by and visit the church for a while and then I would find out later that uh, something was going on in their life and I would just love to sit down and say who told you that? Because I believe it is of the same source. And that's not always the case, but it is many of the times. So last week I started and I asked this question, who told you that the Word of God was not true? Who told you that God's Word was not true? Because that is the first contention that we have in Genesis chapter number 3. Satan began to question the Word of God. He first questioned the content, yea, hath God said. Then he questioned the compassion. He, he he, the way he presented things to Eve, he made her believe that God had withheld something good from her. She did not realize, nor did he honestly tell her that, the, that, that God's word and that command was placed there for her protection, for her preservation, for her peace, and for her prospering. Uh, he didn't tell her those things. He just simply told her, hey, God does not want you to have what you can have. And that was a question in the compassion of God's Word. So who told you that God's Word's not true? Second thing we covered was who told you that God's plan would not work? All the way back in Genesis chapter number 1, we found the plan of God that He gave to man. It included procreation. In verse number 28 of chapter number 1, it said, Be fruitful and multiply. He gave him power. It included power. Man needs power. And God said, You'll have dominion over all things that are, that are upon the earth. He gave he needed provision. He said, oh, listen, I've gave you every herb bearing tree and fruit tree. All of that is yours. He said, I've given you a place. He put them in a garden and he gave them a purpose to dress and keep the garden. And we, uh, we talked about it last week, how that uh, we have all those things today. We have procreation. We are to win souls. We are to go about uh, telling people the gospel so that they can have what we have and we are to have spiritual children. God has given us power when he indwelled us with the Holy Spirit of God. He's given us his provision. That is the word of God. He's given us a place. That is the church. We thank God for the place. Weren't you glad you were in the place this morning? I'm telling you, God showed up and did some things in this place this morning. I sure am glad that I was here. So God gave us a place, the church, and he gave us a purpose to dress and keep it. He gave us the work of God. And I thank the Lord for that. So tonight I want to pick up with the last thing thought, and I want to deal with verse number 8 primarily and ask this question, who told you that God's presence did not matter? 
Who told you that God's presence did not matter? For Adam here has been convinced the best thing that he can do in his condition is to hide from the presence of God. Somehow, somewhere, Adam has gotten the idea that it would be better to be out of God's presence than in God's presence. Can I tell you, when sin comes into your life, it ought to draw you to God so that you can get that sin right instead of pushing you away from God. That is the absolute worst place. I've talked with people who say, well, preacher, I'm going to come to church as soon as I can get some things right. Oh, my dear friend, don't, don't not come to church so you can get things right. Come to church to get things right. That's where God is. That's where God will deal with your heart. Say, well, I just can't read my Bible because things are not right between me and the Lord. Oh, dear friend, pick up the Word of God and read through the pages and let the Holy Ghost of God speak to your heart because what you need right now is the presence of a holy God because that presence will make a difference in your life. But Adam has been convinced for some reason that getting out of the presence of God and hiding himself from the presence of God is the proper thing to do in his condition. So let's examine it for just a few minutes on, on the presence of God. I want to preach this evening on the presence of God and the difference that it makes. I find in Psalm chapter number 16, verse number 11, that the presence of God is joy. The Bible said, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures evermore. The presence presence of God is a blessing in Psalms, and I don't mean it's just a blessing, but I mean it brings a blessing. In Psalms 31, 16, the Bible said, make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Save me for thy mercy's sake. Psalm 67, 1, God be merciful to us and bless us. And listen to this, and cause his face to shine upon us. The word presence here, and uh, the word presence that carries throughout Scripture, it simply means to be face to face with someone. One. And so when Adam, in verse number 8, hid himself from the presence of the Lord, he was hiding himself from the face of God. He did not want to be face to face. I can almost see Adam in the garden that day, in those trees where he was hiding. I can almost see him peeking out, looking to see where God was, looking to see if he was coming. You see, it's not that Adam did not want to see him at all. It wasn't that Adam didn't want to be in the same place, but Adam could not stand the thought of being face to face in the presence of God. But being face to face with God is a place of great blessing. It, the, the presence of God is a hiding place. Psalms 31, 20, that's shall hide me in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. The presence of God is help. In Psalms 42, 5, why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. The presence of God is fellowship. In Psalms 51, verse number 11, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. I like what Ravenhill said. I read one of the quotes this morning, but he also said, I'd rather have 10 people that want God more than 10,000 10, who want to play church. I want to see the glory of God come so our young people don't have to be told to go to church, but they just long to get to the sanctuary where God is. Man, that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in a people, whether it be 10, whether it be 10,000, I'm interested in a people that just can't wait to get to the place where God is. A couple of weeks ago, I preached about Jerusalem and Jerusalem to the children of Israel. It was the place they met with the Lord. It was the place where God was. And certainly, God's house is the place we meet with the Lord. And I know He's omnipresent. And I know He can be all places at all times. And I know we meet with Him in our prayer closet. And I know we meet with Him in the automobile. And I know we meet with Him around the kitchen table. But there is no other place designated like the house of God to be able to come and be in the presence of a holy God as it is the church. So I say amen to what Ravenhill said. Let me say again what I read this morning. Ravenhill said, when did you last tiptoe out of the sanctuary when you couldn't say a word to anybody because you were so overwhelmed with the glory of God? 
the first book of the Gospels, the book of Matthew. Uh, you can turn with me if you want to. We'll run through it quickly. And I've got some things in my notes, but let's just turn there if you'd like to. In the, the first book of the Gospels. Now the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we will not take time to examine them all, but you could, and it would certainly be fitting. But in Matthew chapter number 8, let us look at what a difference the presence of the Lord made in some people's lives. In Matthew chapter number 8, the leper was cleansed. The centurion's servant was healed. Peter's mother-in-law was healed. He calmed the stormy sea, and he cast out devils in Gadara. And that's just one chapter, chapter number 8. And all of those things happened when Jesus showed up. What a difference it was when Jesus passed by. We used to sing the song, Jesus passed by my way, and he made me whole that day. And uh, talks about, oh, what a change in my life since Jesus passed by. In Matthew chapter number 9, as we go through the book of Matthew, he healed the palsy man. He healed two blind men, and he cast out devils in chapter number 9. If you go to chapter number 14, he fed 5,000. He walked on the water. He saved Peter, and he calmed the storm. I wonder what a difference it made in Peter's life when the presence of God was there as he was sinking in those waters. Don't you believe it, mate? Don't don't you believe that it made a great difference the fact that Jesus was there? He was in the presence of God. In Matthew 27, it sure did make a difference to Barabbas, didn't it? Matthew 27 speaks of how Barabbas and Jesus were brought forth. He said, hey, who, who, do you, who do you want us to give to you? And they said, give us Barabbas, crucified Jesus. Don't you believe that it made a difference in Barabbas' life, the fact that Jesus was there? Oh, what a difference it made in the thief's life as he hung there between heaven and earth. And one, one thief on one side railed on him and, and uh, told him to get down and told him to save himself and to save them. And the other said, hey, uh, this is a just man. He doesn't belong to be here. And, he, and he, he doesn't belong here. And he said, hey, remember me when thou enterest into thy kingdom. And Jesus looked at him and said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Can I tell you, it sure made a difference to be in the presence of God. God, imagine that thief hanging with anyone else on the cross of Calvary. Nothing would have ever been done, but because he was in the presence of God, that man was made whole and his life changed forever that day. In Matthew chapter 28, the last chapter of the book of Matthew, it sure did make a difference to some women that had been to the grave. In Matthew 28, the Bible said they had went to the grave. The angel had appeared to him and said, He is not here for he is risen. The Bible said he, the angel told him, Go quickly and tell his disciples. And in verse number 8, the Bible said, And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hell, and they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Don't you think it made a difference in their life when they got into the presence? presence of God. All of their hope had been destroyed. All of their hope was gone. They were, they were disheartened. At least, at least before this, they had a body to go and to view. At least they had a body to tend to and to anoint with the spices. But now, even the body of the Lord had been taken away. They went from hopeless all the way uh, to absolute despondency. But then, on the way back to tell the disciples, Jesus showed up. And what a difference when they got into the presence of God. And I tell you, there's been some hopeless and helpless times that had it not been for getting in the presence of God, I do not know how I would have made it. Oh, what a difference when we got in the presence of God. I want us to go back to Genesis chapter 3 now, and I just want to mention a few things. Brother Jeremy alluded to them, and, uh, and I say amen to it, and I want to deal with them for just a moment. In verse number 8, the Bible said, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. I want you to think for a moment of what God's presence had meant, past tense, had meant to Adam and Eve. Apparently, according to this verse, I believe that we see God has come walking in the garden before. I don't believe this is a first occurrence that we're reading about. I believe this is something that God did on a regular basis. 
I believe that Adam had fellowship with God. In the past, however long it had been, I do not know, but I believe that Adam had fellowship with the Lord before. He had come to walk in the cool of the day before. And as God came to walk in the cool of the day, when they heard the voice of God on those other times, it, it meant gr a great deal of comfort and consolation knowing that the God of heaven, their creator, the one who made all things, the one whose fruit they were eating, the ones whose provisions they were enjoying, the one whose protection they were enjoying, the one who had given them everything that they ever had when he would come to walk in the cool of the day. Adam, I believe when he heard the voice of God, there was something jumped up within his soul said, Hallelujah, it's time to be in the presence of God. It's time to walk with the Lord. It's time to be able to talk with my Creator. It's time to be able to go face to face and talk with the Lord God the creator of all things. Oh, what the presence of God had meant to Adam day after day after day, being able to be in the presence of God. This voice, this presence of God had meant comfort to Adam. Now we, we realize that Adam's living in a time with no needs. Adam has no needs. Adam doesn't have any deficiencies. Adam has every necessity of life that's already been given to him. I believe Adam has peace. I believe Adam has joy. I believe Adam has all of the positive emotions that we enjoy. But I believe he was able to enjoy them much fuller than we do. Because even, even the greatest day of joy in our life, Brother Ken, we are still in a fallen flesh carnality state if that makes sense. But before the fall of man, Adam was not in a fallen state at all. So I believe when Adam experienced joy, he experienced it to the fullest. And when Adam had peace, he had peace to the fullest. And when Adam had the comfort of God, he, he had no barriers and no deficiencies in his life that would drag him down at all. He was unencumbered by anything in the world. He could just enjoy the comfort of being in the presence of God. And I believe every time he heard the voice of God call out in the garden, I believe there was comfort that swelled up in his heart. I believe that there was communion. Adam, Adam would go with the Lord and they would walk and they would talk and they would commune. I wonder what, what God and Adam talked about. I don't know. It's pure speculation. But I wonder if, if God, because he loved Adam so much, I wonder if God walked along and said, Adam, are you happy? Adam, is everything going to suit you? Adam, Adam, are you enjoying the creation that I've given you? Adam, are you enjoying the are you enjoying Eve? Are you enjoying these things? Adam, have I told you that I loved you? I mean, I don't know exactly what the conversations were. I don't believe Adam was pouring his heart out to God because what was he going to pour his heart out about? <laughs> he certainly wasn't complaining to God. What did he have to complain about? Excuse me. I believe that as they communed, it was just a sweet fellowship of God pouring his love out to Adam and Adam pouring his adoration out to God. Maybe as God said, hey, Adam, how are you doing? And maybe Adam would look to God and say, oh, Lord, you wouldn't believe it. I, I'm enjoying the presence. I'm enjoying the things you've given me so much. And, and you come down to talk with me. And Lord, I sure have been looking forward to you coming by today. I mean, ever since yesterday when you left, my heart's been longing for you to come come again. I couldn't wait to hear your voice in the garden. I knew you were coming today. Oh, Lord, I knew there wasn't going to be a time that you didn't care about me. And I've been longing to get back in your presence. And maybe Adam would just say, hey, Lord, let us stop. And let me just look at your face for a while. Because that's what the Bible said to be in the presence was to be face to face. Maybe, maybe Adam would say, Lord, would it be all right if we just stayed right here and, and just let me look at you? Just let me enjoy being face to face with Almighty God, being face to face with the one who cares and loves me more than any, anyone could ever imagine. This presence of God had meant communion, unencumbered by anything. You ever tried to pray, and when you pray, everything that's going on in your life begins to try to jump between you and the communion you have with the Lord? Adam didn't have any of that. 
And I try not to use the word aggravating, but it pains me sometimes to pray and to pray, and it seems like I have a good connection, and then all of a sudden, man, it just, something jumps in there, tries to draw my mind and my attention off of me talking with the Lord. My heart seems to be swelling up with praise, and then all of a sudden, some situation or circumstance tries to steal my joy away. Adam had none of that. Man, when Adam was communing with God, there was nothing in between. Oh, what fellowship and communion the presence of God meant to Adam. But I want you to notice what happened in verse number 8. Now that same presence that had meant comfort and communion now brought conviction and condemnation. This one decision that Adam had made of partaking of that fruit... This one choice that Adam made that plunged man into sin and, and uh, we are still seeing the effects of it today. This, this one sin that came into Adam's life had so changed everything. Nothing would ever be the same. They would never be able to commune as they had before. And that face that he used to enjoy being in front of and having the presence of God face to face with him now instead of comfort when Adam heard the voice of God walking in the garden and it was not comfort and communion that Adam was thinking about. But Adam fell under, exa- fell under heavy conviction and condemnation because when the voice of God was heard, he realized things would never be the same. He had disobeyed God. He had broken God's heart. He had broken fellowship. He had broken communion. Nothing would ever be the same. It's what Adam is feeling now as he hides there in the garden. The presence of God had meant such a wonderful time and now it was such a terrible, heart-wrenching time for Adam. I remember as a little boy, as a little boy when I was young, as a child I've seen this in my own children and I experienced it in my own life. I remember when you'd get in a service and God would show up as a child. It just seemed to be so peaceful. Even before I was saved, and I've experienced this with my children, before they were saved, they'd get in the car and say, boy, that was a good service. They, have no, they had no idea what went on in that service. They had no idea uh, uh, what had happened, but they knew when God showed up, there was a peace that came over that place. There was a joy that even children who had never been saved, there, there was just a joy and a peace at being in the presence of God. But then I watched it in each one of my children as the presence of God in a service stopped being a comfort and it stopped being a communion and it started bringing conviction. I remember watching each one of my children instead of uh, of seeing them looking around and enjoying the service thinking, man, this is great. People are really getting help. They didn't know what was going on. There was just a peacefulness about the presence of God. But then, Brother Ken, I watched them. Instead of looking around with a smile on their face at the testimonies of things that were going on, I I began to see them drop their head and fidget around a little bit. Why? Because the same presence that had brought comfort was beginning to bring conviction. Why? Because there was a realization of sin coming into their life. They were beginning to realize all the things that had been heard, that they had been taught about being a sinner, they were true about them. And the presence of God that used to be comfort to them now was conviction to them. And they were uncomfortable. I've I've seen people come in. I've seen people come in that were not saved by God's grace, and I've seen great, great amounts of conviction. And I've seen them sit there and squirm and fidget. I've seen them uncomfortable. I've seen them weep. I've seen them hold on. I've seen them tremble in the presence of God. The presence of God that at one time as a child, I'm sure brought comfort to them, whether they knew it or not brought comfort to them. But at some point in time, when there was a realization of sin, that presence of God no longer brought comfort. It brought conviction and condemnation. And certainly that happened in, in, in our life. It happened in your life as you grew up, especially if you grew up around the things of God, you saw that happen in your life. But aren't you glad that it didn't stop there? The same presence of God that at one time to Adam had meant comfort and had meant communion now meant conviction 
and condemnation. But I want you to notice for a moment what the presence of God would mean. You see, when in verse number 8, Adam hears the voice of God and he's convicted and he's condemned in his sin. But because God showed up, because of conviction, because of the condemnation that came upon Adam, that same presence also meant compassion and a covering. If God had not shown, do you not believe that God knew what had happened? Jeremy, Brother Jeremy alluded to it this morning. God was not looking for Adam in the sense of he did not know where he was. He was calling for him because it was time to fellowship. Do you not believe that God knew what had taken place? He is an omnipotent God. He's an omniscient God. He knows everything. Do you not believe that, that, that what Adam had done had already was known to God? It was not a surprise to him, but yet God had to come to the garden. And as he came, his presence brought conviction, but the same presence that brought conviction is the same presence that a few verses later is bringing compassion and a covering. And I want to bless the Lord for the day that conviction turned to covering. I thank the Lord for the day when I was no longer convicted, but I was converted. I was saved by the grace of God. And now because of salvation, because of the covering of the blood of Jesus, because the blood has been applied, now the presence of God shows up. Oh my, how the presence of God came in here this morning and he came through the pews and I don't know how far he went out there, but I know he came up right about here and he dwelled there for a while and it, it had been a while since I just really felt that I had been that close in his presence and to think that I could, could enjoy the fellowship and communion of a whole Holy God. And what happened? Hey, the presence of God didn't change. It used to bring conviction, but now because I'm covered, it brings comfort again in the presence of God. This presence, if we go over to verse number 22, I'm sorry, verse number 21, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. Clothe them. If I read that right, the Bible said that the Lord God made coats of skins and clothed them. Brother Chase, come help me for a second. You know what that means? God did not... Excuse me one second. Let me... Make a mechanical adjustment. God did not make coats of skin available and say, there. God didn't make, God did not make it available to Adam and say, do with it what you will. The Bible said God made coats of skin and clothed them. So he, God himself brought the coats of skin. And God himself, wrapped, and by the way, <clears throat> God's bigger than he was. So if God made him design for him, it probably fit about like that. Now I know God took into consideration, I'm sure, the size of Adam. God covered him. Can I tell you what happened? Jesus Christ made salvation available. But when I knelt in prayer and asked the Lord to save me, God himself not only had made it available, but God himself applied it. He didn't say, hey, salvation's at Calvary. Go pick it up if you want it. He said, you come to Calvary, I'll put it on you. And when he clothed us in the righteousness of Christ, he himself clothed us with the righteousness of Christ. And, and that same presence, thank you, Chase, that same presence that once in Adam's life had meant comfort, but that presence then meant conviction. That same presence was the God that came and covered them. And is that not the picture we have of us being saved by the grace of God? As a child, I enjoyed being around the things of God. But there came a time, Daddy, I remember you talking about going over to Roy's house. How uncomfortable you used to be going to Roy's house because you'd get under conviction. Then after he got saved, 
he'd go to Roy's house and they'd just have a grand time because the, the presence of God that once meant conviction now meant a covering and a compassion. And I guess the best way to think about this would be simply this. What would Adam have done if God hadn't showed up? God, God knew what had taken place. It was not a surprise to God. I don't even believe God came to the garden to find out if it was true. God knew what had taken place. But God showed up anyway. And because God showed up, because of the conviction and condemnation that came, by the way, that's got to come. If the presence of God never brings conviction in your life, it can never bring a covering. Because you're going to have to admit what you are. You're going to admit the fact you're wrong. You're going to have to admit the fact you've offended God. You're going to have to admit the fact you're a sinner. And that's what conviction does. It brings us to the realization that we are a sinner. There's a lot of churches today who have chosen a program over the presence of God. There's a lot of churches who have chosen uh, some other kind of pursuit over the presence of God. There are churches today that have manufactured a presence of God. I'm not interested in that. I, I think perhaps the one thing that is worse than not having the presence of God is having a fake presence of God. Can't stand it. I've been around that, man. You ain't got to drum up God. You, you don't have to make him big. <laughs> Brother Ken, when he shows up, he shows himself plenty big. You ain't got to pump him up. So many churches, so many people have forsaken the presence of God for some other pursuit in their life. Who told you that the presence of God didn't matter? Who told you that? I think of people that are sitting in churches today that churches that once had the presence of God, churches that once uh, God moved in those churches and the power of God was, was real and, and people enjoyed being in God's presence. And now it seems that very rarely, if ever, does God come by simply because he's not invited. He's not programmed in there. He has no room to work and no liberty to work. And if God doesn't have liberty to work, he's not going to work. And I, I want to sit down with those people and ask them, who told you that the presence of God didn't matter? People are raising their children in churches that have programs, but no presence. And they wonder why they lose their children. They wonder why their children are not interested in the things of God. Who told you? that the presence of God didn't matter. So, well, the presence of God's just for, that, that's just for down there at the church, but doesn't need to go home with Who told you that the presence of God didn't matter in the home? Who told you? What about, what about the school system? Are we not seeing now that the presence of God did matter in the school system? But he was asked to leave, and being the gentleman he was, he did. Who told you? Administrators, who told you that the presence of God didn't matter? And now we have our leadership in our country telling God we don't want you. We don't, we don't want you around our children. We don't want you guiding our affairs. We want to make our own decisions. There's a, right, there's a way which is right in our own eyes, and we're going to walk in that way. And what they don't know, they didn't read the other part of the verse. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is death. They didn't read the rest of that. And they're telling God, we don't want you. We don't want you. And if I could... I wish there were millions of people listening. And I wish this was going to be viewed by millions on YouTube. It's probably not. But if it were, I would like to ask you this question. Who told you that the presence of God didn't matter in a country? Who told you the presence of God didn't matter in a capital meeting? Who told you the presence of God didn't matter in the Senate? Who told you the presence of God didn't matter in the White House? Who told you these things? I have a very strong feeling. It's the same one that told Adam, hey, 
God didn't mean that. Same one that told Adam, hey, don't, don't worry about God's plan. I've got something better for you. The same one that told Adam, you can get by without it. Don't worry about it. You just go with me and everything will be fine. Who told you that? As we stand to our feet tonight with every head bowed, every eye closed,